Life starts all over again when it gets crisp in the fall. F. Scott Fitzgerald. This is the payoff. This is the fun. This is the excitement. I'm lucky. I'm doing the same things I wanted to do when I was five, six, and seven. I'm playing games. That's why I feel every Saturday when I go out there, hey, God, am I lucky. You know how many times I get asked, how long are you going to coach? What keeps you in coaching the whole bit? And you know what? It's days like this and games like this that I don't want to give up. Tunnel tomorrow night with these guys with fire in our eyes and determined to pull up our pants and say, let's go! Philosopher, fundraiser, teacher, student, husband, father, grandfather, and of course, football coach. Joe Paterno is all of these things. And mostly he is a Nittany Lion, a Penn Stater to the core for 53 years now. When Joe Paterno first came to State College, it was as an assistant coach under Rip Engel in 1950. He was going to be a lawyer, following his father's footsteps. The assistant coaching job was an afterthought. He would spend a year in this small college town and then go out and leave his mark on the world. Penn State in the 50s was an underfunded rural state university often referred to as a cow college. I hated this place. I'm a Brooklyn kid, went to school in Providence, Rhode Island, and I was, uh, you know, loud mouthed, and talk funny, <laughs> still talk funny. And in fact, I had told Rip Engel, my head coach, hey, I'm, I'll be gone after this season. The years of assistant coaching were the most innocent and uncomplicated times of Paterno's career. State college grew on him. There was football, and eventually marriage to a girl who was a Penn State graduate and a tutor to some of the football players. And I've often thought how ironic it is that one of the reasons I, it, I was unhappy was because I didn't think that I could date co-eds, and I ended up marrying a co-ed. <laughs> and so, you know, it, when I was 35. After 16 years of service as an assistant coach, Joe got the head coaching job when Rip Engel retired. I find myself quoting the Paterno away, for lack of a better term. I'm sitting there going, hey, the guy takes care of little things. Take care of little things, the big things take care of themselves. I, I look around, want somebody to slap me. That comes right out of Joe's mouth. Hey, look, you either get better or you're going to get worse, fellas. You're not going to stay in one place. Hey, you want to be great someday, huh? You got to pay a price to be great. It doesn't come easy. Oh, just little lessons, you know. Uh, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Come on, take off now. Let's go, bro. Keep hustling, and something good will happen to you. You never get too high with the highs. You never get too low with the lows. Got to get first downs before you get touchdowns. If you only looked at him, you would say, what a geek. You know, the guy, the guy is dorky looking. This is like talking to Peter Falk. How can Peter Falk be intimidating? It's almost the whole philosophy of what made Columbo a great TV show. No one thought Peter Falk was as smart as he was. Concentrate! Come back in the huddle! That gives him the charisma factor, and it also lets him manipulate people. Seven down, four to go! Right? We gotta win the next one! Yeah. 
There are contradictions in him. He speaks about winning isn't the only thing. He differs from Vince Lombardi in preaching that. But uh, in some sense, winning is the only thing for him. Ah, uh, he made you duck. He'll be looking for your job next spring, Nick. We better show him you're the boss now. He was just yelling, do it again, do it again. And then did it again. Do it again, do it again. Adams. Just get up and get back in the huddle. Hey, Blackledge, that's terrible. Get out of here. The image of Penn State football mirrors that of Paterno. Understatement and modesty, with an emphasis on tradition. The uniforms, bland and nondescript. No names on the back of the jerseys. No stickers on the helmet signifying individual accomplishments. Players clean shaven, coats and ties on the road, and hats off indoors. Trust, integrity, education. When people talk about Penn State, they talk about Joe Paterno. Many critics felt that it was too good to be true. College sports had been corrupted by money, gambling, drug use, violence, and other societal ills. In 1979, Penn State began to learn some of those lessons. That was a real black cloud that whole year. I mean, things started going wrong in the preseason, and they never stopped. At the season's onset, Joe's star safety flunked out of school. Then a player was arrested and convicted on rape charges. One tailback quit the team because of lack of playing time. Another was suspended for DUI. Then they go to the uh, Liberty Bowl, and one of their players ends up at 4 o'clock in the morning stumbling into some private apartment and was lucky he didn't get shot. Paterno had always been a dictator. The players of the 50s didn't question his authority. In the 70s, that changed. He was used to Eddie Haskell. Good morning, Mrs. Cleaver, Mr. The wonderful day we're having. And he got me. There were a lot of run-ins. We did these half-mile tests. And you'd run a half-mile, then you wait, then you'd run another half-mile. So I ran the first one, and I just was getting as tight as a brick, you know? Started running the second one, and I quit. And Joe comes running over with his voice, you know, his guy, his glasses he has on. Nothing! His voice is going, what are you doing? And I said, coach, if I got to chase a guy for half a mile, he's going to score every time. Well, the team thought that was funny, but he didn't. Paterno took Millen's captaincy away, another distraction for an underachieving 8-4 and four team. When the season ended, Paterno would take personal blame saying that he just hadn't been responsive enough to his players' needs, even admitting that he had gotten to thinking of them as a bunch of jackasses. Joe would rededicate himself as he had so often during his career through discipline and Spartan simplicity, the foundation of his success. The season, Joe Paterno, brought to you by DirecTV. Welcome back to Nittany Lion Hotline. Tonight, our guest is head football coach Joe Paterno. Uh, Bobby in Harrisburg, go ahead. You're on with Joe. How come Penn State's the only team that doesn't have the American flag on their uniform? Oh, uh, boy. Gee, I have no idea. I would hope everybody realizes that uh, we're patriots. Green 50! Years ago, uh, there was a big parade in New York City on the Columbus Day. And a lot of Italian Americans wanted me to go march. I said, I don't have anything to prove. The only thing you get to prove is that, you, that what have we done to make America better? Uh, uh, what do we stand for? Day in and day out. You know, rah, 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 flags all over the place. So I, uh, and that's not the, you know, you always got to be careful because when I say something like that, so there's some people who really want to wear the flag, and, and that's fine. I have no problems with that. But I, uh, but I really am reluctant to ever just put symbols up. 
I think actions, actions are important. Brooklyn, New York, Joe Paterno's hometown. Joe competed here at touch football, stick ball, and life. He spent most of his youth in the Flatbush area of this great melting pot. We were all right in that pot. We were all struggling, fighting, helping each other. It was Jews, and it was Irishmen, and Germans, and Italians, and the whole bit. To me, diversity was, I didn't know, you know, we had a kid, Sammy Finkelstein, the best punch ball player we had on the team. Every night, five o'clock, Sammy would have to leave. He had to go to Jewish church school. So, you know, he might have said, hey, we'll see you, Kaiki. And he might have said, well, you wop, stay and play. You know, I mean, it was done. It was, uh, you know, we loved each other and respected each other. There was little money and an emphasis on hard work and education, especially education. That message was reinforced by the family celebration held when his father passed the bar exam. Angelo Paterno was a liberal man who encouraged his children to have fun. His mother was a stern taskmaster, always demanding that her children excel in everything. I get a little bit of the things that make it possible for me to have stayed in coaching as long as I have in the sense of understanding people from my father. And I've been able to stay in it as a competitor because I think it's like my mom, I can't stand to be second. Joe and his younger brother, George, became an explosive football tandem at Brooklyn Prep, the private school where Joe's dad had to bargain with the headmaster to send his sons because he couldn't afford the tuition. He was a very willful uh, a person when it came to competitiveness. And when he was about six, I was about four or five, and uh, we were on the beach playing with a rake. I tried to take his rake and he hit me in the face on the nose with it, and I still got the scar. I always said he kept me out of Hollywood. We are! We are! We are! For Joe, the team concept, as in we are Penn State, derives from neighborhood, from family, from Rome. His discovery didn't come from his travels, but rather through Virgil's epic poem, The Aeneid, which was introduced to him while he was in his senior year at Brooklyn Prep High School. The story of the Aeneid evolves. Troy is being sacked by the Greeks, and Aeneas flees with his father on his back, his son at his side, both protecting the past and the future. After terrible storms and battles at sea, Aeneas washes up on the shores of Italy and founds Rome. This is Aeneas's destiny, his fate. But it is in his suffering and his ability to act when all seems lost around him that fascinated Paterno. Fatum, the term that was used, you know, fate. You're fated to do certain things. Had a tremendous impact on what I felt I could do and what I was fated to do. Aeneas always overcame things. No matter how beaten down he was, he always seemed to be able to call on some kind of inner strength. In times when I've had some problems, whether I was on the right track, whether I'd have enough guts to go on with what I was doing, it's been kind of a hero for me. Paterno's teams have struggled and suffered recently as the Lions have limped to two losing seasons in the last three years. They were calling for his head. There were people whispering it. Some of you say you want him gone, and I know you're out there. You're going to take that walk to the mound and say, you know, this guy's lost his fastball. Are you going to, are you going to take that walk to the mound? Gary, this come here. man wants to know all about Joe Paterno. Turn the tape off. <laughs> After a one and four start in 2001, they hosted Ohio State and trailed by 18 points. It was the type of situation where Virgil's hero, Aeneas, thrived. I mean, he loves it when the odds are long and things aren't looking, looking great. He loves to pull those games out. Oh, 
Carlos Dunn. He's become the winningest coach in the history of Division One in college football, surpassing the legendary Bear Bryant. Some of us don't understand the difference between excellence and success. Success is really based on somebody else's opinion of us. Excellence, we have control of it. And that if you believed in certain things and you worked hard at it and you, and you, you, you stuck to your values and your morals, excellence just becomes part of you. And you don't worry whether somebody says, hey, he's good or bad. Count on them to tell you whether you've been successful, but count on yourself for your excellence. Robert Frost said, home is where when you go there, they must take you in. I associate Penn State with a sense of permanency, a sense of consistency. Coming back home is a comfort because it kind of reminds you of your elemental self, of who you really are. Grammy-winning composer Mike Reed was an All-America defensive tackle for Joe Paterno on the undefeated teams of 1968 and 1969. Teams that put Penn State into national prominence. Okay, all right, pretty good, pretty good. But in the late 60s, the perception was that college football in the East was mediocre. Teams like Texas, Ohio State, USC, Alabama, and Nebraska garnered all the attention playing in strong conferences. He was kind of the pioneer out there for Eastern college football. He was always fighting national media. I mean, there were a couple of times, I forget what interviews, where they got Penn State confused with University of Pennsylvania, and that just got Joe just absolutely livid. Nice going, man. <laughs> the AP and the UPI will name Texas number one, as we know, uh, after this game. President Nixon was casting his lot with the Texas Longhorns before the Bulls were even played. Paterno was livid. Penn State finished the 1969 season undefeated and number two in the polls. I think the fans, the, the players themselves, all the people who really love football, are entitled to have a champion decided on the field. I definitely felt that we were slighted. And even looking back now, we were the best team. No doubt about it. We could have matched up against anyone. We felt that we were number one. Joe Paterno said late in his career, I hope that they are not going to judge me on how many games I won or lost. Rather, I hope they judge me on the impact we have had on people's lives. Mike Reed became a showpiece for something Paterno called the grand experiment. The idea that you could blend football with academics, graduate players, and still win. You're here for one main reason, to get an education. You gotta do the book work. You're here for a second main reason, to play football. But you're also here to experience a change in life, this metamorphosis that the university life allows you. you know, go do different things, get involved in campus politics, join a fraternity. He'd walk every day to work, and he would knock on the window to get himself for classes. <laughs> Come on! In 1949, Paterno quarterbacked Brown University to an 8-1 record. He led the team in kickoff returns, punt returns, scoring, and had six interceptions playing defense. Stanley Woodward wrote of uh, Joe. He said he can't run, he can't pass. All he can do is think and win. And that's pretty much the kind of player that Joe was. Paterno received his degree in English. His years at Brown told Joe that athletes could be more than dumb jocks. He's 13 traffic. Come on, Dave! 
Those brakes won't hang it on. Huh? Brakes hang it on. I can't help it. What the hell are we going to do? We're in a tough ball game. I happen to see Joe, and I said, Joe, I have one of your players. He's missed two classes now. And he said to me, uh, have you spoken to him? And I said, yes, but I'm not going to speak to him again. He said, don't, don't speak to him. If he doesn't measure up, you flunk him. And I said, well, he might be your quarterback. And he said, I don't care. He said, if he doesn't go to class and the word gets around the locker room, hey, you don't have to go to school at Penn State, he'll ruin my team for the next two or three years. In 1973, after eight years as head coach, Joe Paterno was asked to be the commencement speaker at Penn State's graduation. The grand experiment was working. The same message that Paterno was preaching to recruits was being heard by parents all across the land. Penn State was developing an identity. But I want to assure you that I stepped outside my role as a football coach with a lot of trepidation and with a lot of humility. In fact, I may be the only commencement speaker of the year who doesn't give his opinion on Watergate. Uh, except I do want to say one thing. I've wondered how President Nixon could know so little about Watergate in 1973 and know so much about college football in 1969. State College is located in central Pennsylvania, halfway between Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. And on six or seven Saturdays each fall, an American carnival takes place here. As many as 110,000 people from all over the state and beyond make a pilgrimage to Beaver Stadium, making it the third largest city in the state on football Saturdays. This is the house of Joe built. I mean, that's all this is him. Joe's a good man. He, at heart, he takes care of people. I have his three, 324 socks on. He could have been an amazing politician. He has the, the calculation and manipulation of, of the brilliant guy he is. And yet, he has the charm and the intuitive skills, almost of an artist in a lot of ways, the sense of humor. Usually, you don't see those two things together. The folk hero status that Paterno enjoys in Pennsylvania derives from a decision he made in 1972. Paterno accepted an offer to coach the New England Patriots for $1 million when he was making only $35,000 a year at State College. Now look, you guys got to put a drive together. Now let's see if you got a little class and you get a good drive together. The night before his press conference announcement, he went to bed and told his wife, honey, you're going to bed with a millionaire. In the middle of the night, I was nursing the baby and uh, started to cry. I couldn't help it. I just cried and cried. I did not want to leave the small town. Went to bed and I got thinking, and, you know, I'm, I'm getting seduced uh, by money. Paterno woke up the next morning and told his wife, I can't do it. I can't leave. Much like his childhood hero, Virgil's Aeneas, Paterno felt something in his gut about what he was fated to do in order to fulfill his destiny. College coaches have a different mission in life. They are trying to develop young men for the next 30, 40, 50, 60 years of, uh, of living. You're dealing with so many negative things. I got a death in my family. My girlfriend's pregnant. You inherited the family problems of 18, 19, and 20 year old kids. Pro football deals with anything like that? That generation values consistency. They value constancy in terms of what you stand for. Money is not important. It's about what you can do for other people what you, and serving people. Well, Goldman's starting to look better. Yeah. With his commitment to Penn State now secure, Joe set his sights on the one prize that had eluded him, a national championship. The 1979 Sugar Bowl. Number one ranked Penn State Nittany Lions. Number two ranked Crimson Tide of Alabama. Could be the ball of wax right here. Fourth and goal with a half a yard. Good 
Roman. He didn't make it. Paterno blamed himself for the defeat. He had come up short when it had mattered most versus Bear Bryant. I was going to get out of coaching. I went to New York, spent three, four days in New York, went back to Brooklyn, went back to my old church. And I was pouting a little bit, and I think that showed. They moped. They moped through spring practice. They moped through the whole season. And he was getting all dressed to go to the uh, Hall of Fame dinner. And I said, don't come home till you get this out of your system. I can't keep living with this. It was as if someone was asking Paterno to just be patient, because he finally saw the results of his work pay off when the Lions played Georgia in the 1983 Sugar Bowl. Three, two, one, Penn State National Champion! What a tribute to this football team. What a tribute to his coach. A few weeks later, Joe was invited to speak to the board of trustees. His message was clear. Let's use this football success as a fulcrum to make Penn State a better school. Let's raise money for new buildings. Let's lift up departments that aren't as good as they should be. Let's pursue brilliant young professors. In short, let's make Penn State number one in everything. A funny thing happened last year to Joe Paterno after his Nittany Lions overtime loss to Iowa. He was watching what was perhaps his last chance at an undefeated season slip away when he blew his cool. To me, he looked like somebody who was just barely in control of his emotions. I mean, he was furious. That was a scary picture. As he's running with that maniacal look on his face, I can hear Paterno in the back of my mind going, keep your poise, Millen, keep your poise. And I just thought to myself, you know what? I understand. Every now and then, lose your poise. It's OK, but get it back. I thought he'd make a couple of lousy calls on the other side of the field. Joe Paterno has always had an on-off relationship with the press. Through the highs... Well, it's nice to win, isn't it? <laughs> ...and the lows. I'm going to tell you guys, okay? No sense even wasting your time. In a single moment, he can be engaging. Hey, you got long pants on, eh? One for you. It's cold. Don't give me that. Charming. But you guys must think I'm still a, di a dinosaur. Sullen. I don't know. And even flippant. Uh, you guys think more about those things than I do. But never phony. Don't bait me, will you? <laughs> he doesn't get mad at tough questions as long as they're well thought out. He wants to get into a conversation because he believes he's going to win it. It's like a politician, a great politician in a debate. Bad politicians don't want to be in a debate. The good ones love it. The good ones know it's going to make them look better. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. He took over in 66, and there was a small group of reporters who used to come up, about 10 of them, to cover Penn State. The small group would uh, informally talk with him about literature, politics and about his desires to have uh, higher standards in college athletics. And they would write very favorably about it. He was partially a media creation as a model of a sports leader. In the 60s, when college football was just starting to flower on network TV, Joe courted the press, allowing them to practices, even giving them his game plan the night before kickoff. 
That all changed in 1979, when Joe made what he thought were off-the-record remarks at an informal press gathering. When asked whether he intended to get into politics, Joe responded, what? And turned the game over to the Barry Switzers and Jackie Sherrills? It was printed. He made it in the presence of a few media that he trusted, and he regretted it, and he called to, to apologize for that. And I admire and respect the man for doing that. You sit around and you talk about a lot of things, some of which can be reported using your own good judgment, and some of which obviously can't be reported. You know, maybe I'm old school, but I firmly believe that you have to have a climate of trust. It's all over. They're jumping for joy in Happy Valley. Hey, I think I get out my blue underwear now. Another national championship led to a hotter media spotlight. Joe began to retreat, ever more wary of cameras and typewriters. I just wish we weren't so wrapped up in big time college football. We got this stuff going on. The media drives you nuts. I mean, it's great. Everybody's, oh boy, are you gonna, are you gonna be on television? You know, that, that's not my cup of tea, to be frank with you. And so the press continued to write stories about Joe's transgression in the Iowa game last year. I think if I had it to do over, I would have kept my mouth shut. You know, I should have been a little bit more, hey, calm down, let's let this thing go. One newspaper editorial in the most politically correct way suggested that Paterno's actions could incite violence against referees. Another made a case for Joe's actions costing Larry Johnson the Heisman Trophy, even though Johnson's big games came long after the Iowa incident. Any of you guys ever heard of H.L. Mencken? who was a great editor and one of the great editors of all times, he, had a, he said there are only two stories, and they go like this, oh, the wonder of it and oh, the shame of it. Now, I don't know where this fits, <laughs> but somewhere in there, you guys have been taken. Okay, I'll see. I gotta go. Every five or six years, somebody will come up here with the goal that they're going to expose Penn State. They're, they're going to turn over the magic rock that's got this dark secret hidden beneath it. And they leave shaking their heads, and they go back and they write a puff piece, of it, which is not to say that Joe's perfect, but they just find out that it is as advertised for the most part. It's been great to see a bunch of kids get in there and struggle and fight in spite of those. When I am home, I'm home, you know, for, for weeks at a time, and which is good, and I think something that most people don't get to do. But last year I was away about a month, and that was kind of hard. My daughter calls me a lot. She'll call me three, four times in a row sometimes. Unlimited calling gives you the freedom to stay connected, whatever the reason. The neighborhood built by MCI. Call as often as you want for one low monthly price. Tonight at 7.30, Colorado has reloaded and is ready to make another run at the cup against the Wild. Score! Or an ACC shootout as Clemson tries to keep up with Phillip Rivers and his prolific passing attack. And at 10, two of the Mountain's top QBs take center stage as Chance Harrington Air Force tangle with Bradley Van Pelt in Colorado State. October has it all on ESPN and ESPN2 tonight. Okay, thank you. Found the perfect house? I think so. Where are you getting your loan? Uh, our friend knows this mortgage broker. How do you know it's the best loan for you and not the mortgage broker? Uh, we don't. Well, at eLoan, you get a personal loan consultant who's not driven by commissions on the type of loan you choose. So you get the right loan at a great rate. That is a great rate. Nothing should come between you and the right loan. That's why there's eLoan. Apply now at eLoan.com or call 1-800-ELOAN-22. Need cash fast? Just pick up the phone now for up to $500. Qualify in two minutes or less. National Money Service can help you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You're welcome. The money you need will be in your account tomorrow. Thank you so much. Let us help you with unplanned car repair bills, medical bills, household repairs, or anything else you need money for. So if you need up to $500 before your next paycheck, we can help. Call now. 
Call National Money Service now. As the seasons fade amidst the cheers and generations of players grow up before his eyes, Joe Paterno remains unchanged. His pants are still tightly cuffed, just as they were in the 60s when his wife complained that he always got mud on the one good pair he owned. When you walk around downtown State College, everybody's young. It's really like you have found the fountain of youth. Now, you know, I'm aging, my dad's, everybody's getting older, but the students are all staying the same age, and I think he loves that. Same school, same wife, same habits and routines, and the same long walks down the same paths. While Penn State University has done nothing but change, they have as many living alumni as any university in the country, and the stadium has grown from 46,000 to 107,000. The game means something to you because it matters. I want players like that. I want my coaches. For the, it better mean something to you when you walk out on that. This is what you do. This is what we are. Class, class, class. And when it came down to putting up or shutting up, you put up. Ah! Class, class. One day, we, we had just lost to Ohio State. He came into the locker room. He didn't talk about the win and losing, but he talked about what this program really mean, the reason why we wear black shoes, the reason why there's no names on the back of our jersey. He says, it's not you. There's a guy in that number that played in that jersey. He, he set the groundwork for this thing. And until that day was a lesson for me. Watch Paterno and see how he reacts. When one of his players gets caught up in the emotion of the moment, even if there is the faint suggestion of, hey, look at me, you don't think there's fire in the belly of that 75 year old man? Do not celebrate. I think he said it a little more emphatically than that. But Joe knows that this is a team game and not an individual game. Family is the essence of the Penn State way, the Paterno way. Turnover. Joe and Sue Paterno raised five children, all Penn State graduates, and now have 12 grandchildren. These are hams, like the rest of them. <laughs> Takes that to his, mother, his grandmother's side. I can't own these. They, they, none of them look like they're Italian. <laughs> I said to him at one point, funny thing's going to happen to you on the way to a national championship. You're going to turn around and we're going to be all grown up. And you will have missed it. If you said, well, give me your one regret you have, that would be it. Because they could grow up so fast on you. My first year with five and five, and everybody's thinking, well, he's a good assistant coach, we ain't gonna make it as a head coach. So now I'm in there trying to establish myself and neglected the kids. It was all my job. I feel bad for myself, because Sue will say to me every once in a while, you remember when Dave did this? You remember when Mary Kay did that? And I don't remember, you know. I may have been with them, but my mind was six, you know, my mind was three touchdowns away. The Paternos spearheaded an effort in 1998 to raise funds to build a new library on campus. Joe and Sue donated $3.5 million to the university. At what other school do you have a library named after a football coach and an athletic facility named after a university president? One of the greatest things that I think Joe can do is expect a great deal of himself expect a great deal of other people and convince those other people that they are capable of accomplishing those things. You know, you get the phone call one day and it says, uh, Coach Paterno has requested that you consider joining us at a library endowment board meeting, which gets interpreted as, make sure that you're there at, on time, okay? 
In 1994, another undefeated season, but only a number two ranking. Years earlier, the snub bothered Paterno. Now he didn't seem to care. Perhaps he was mellowing. These days, there is a bittersweet feeling in the air around Happy Valley. The football team still provides the connective tissue for the university in the fall. But the team hasn't been in contention for a national championship in 10 years. He's in a tough situation because I know how it is out there in recruiting. The competition is telling those kids, Joe Paul's not going to be there much longer. He's not going to see you through your career. For me to tell you that I'm going to be here four more years is a little bit cocky because I don't know what the good Lord's got in store for me. I could walk down the street and have a heart attack. I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not kidding you. I'm 35 years old. But I also tease him a little bit. I, I said, you know, and the guy that's telling you that I may not be here, you know, I said, you know, in the last 10 years, there's probably 40 of those guys that ain't coaching anymore. I can't tell a kid I'm going to be here five years, six years. I mean, who knows? But knows, neither can anybody else. At least his feet are comfortable. Wolverine Dura shocks with compressor technology. They don't quit. Want to take off? Enterprise Rent-A-Car has takeoff weekend specials from $9.99 a day. That's Friday to Monday, just $9.99 a day. So take off this weekend. Log on to Enterprise.com or call 1-800-RENT-A-CAR. Sports Illustrated wants to know, who's your favorite NFL team? Cowboys! J-E-T-S! Yes, 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 yes! Show off your favorite team's colors with this exclusive offer from Sports Illustrated. Free with your paid subscription. I can't believe it! Start off with a long sleeve t-shirt of your favorite NFL team. Pick a team, any team. The choice is yours. Come on to my team, baby! Go Steelers! Let's go, back! Call now and you'll also get another free gift from Sports Illustrated. This Wilson Mini Football with the logo of your favorite team. Both are free when you order 56 issues of Sports Illustrated for only $1.59 an issue. Save more than 50% off the cover price. When you use your credit card, you'll also get this free stadium blanket from the NFL team of your choice, free. All this stuff for free? Thank you, SI. Wear your team colors with pride with three great gifts free from Sports Illustrated. Call now. I really hope that everybody understands that this is a very unique, and I, I know I repeat myself all the time, but I feel so, so warm. I was driving out here on the, on, the, on the bypass and looking at the valley. I don't know how many of you guys are old enough to remember the movie, How Green Was My Valley. You know what I mean? How green is our valley? And you see the kids that come up here, what kind of people representing Penn State I hope you realize what a wonderful, wonderful experience we're all having. I don't mean you alone. I'm having, too. When he first laid eyes on those green hills, he had hated it. Now, approaching his 77th birthday, he looks back on his life. The line that once seemed so blurry between football, community, and family now seems so clear. It shapes one rich life, as if it was his destiny all along. I was always the guy that seemed to ask him, you know, what are you thinking about as far as your career? I didn't say, when are you going to retire? Because, Jones, the only retirement I'm concerned about is yours. <laughs> and huge laughter all over, across the room. Laughter dies down. I can't even get him a response. He goes, and I can't wait. More laughter, you know. It's, so whatever he said after that didn't matter. Everyone had their sound bite. What a day it is. A momentous day in the history of Penn State football and certainly the career of Coach Joe Paterno. You ever think he'd reach 300? No, no, I, I, no, I didn't think he would last that long as, as a coach. <laughs> 100,000 voices strong on their feet and raised in song. All in unison, as if by fate, they were all shouting, 
We are Penn State. In the summer of 2002, Joe lost his brother, George, who had been a football coach and then a radio broadcaster for Penn State. George had always been the guy who could give Joe constructive criticism. I uh, think of my brother, George, all the time. I feel as if maybe I didn't spend as much time with him as I would like to. The job is, you know, that I have is so demanding and there's so many people involved in it. I think there was a guy that always told him the truth. And when you reach that age in life, it's hard to find, when, when those people are gone, it's hard to find other people to tell you that. We were close. We went to college and lived together for one semester till the dorm advisor said, why don't you guys separate? Nobody can sleep. <laughs> you fight all the time. I, I like to walk, and I walk back in the woods. And I, 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 no, I, I do, I think of my mortality. I think all of anybody, when you get to a certain age, starts to think about it. I don't, I'm not, I'm, um, you know, I think it was Tennessee Williams said that he knew nobody was immortal, but he thought maybe he was the exception. <laughs> it's weird for me. I drive by a statue every day on my way into work. <laughs> it's become a point now. The first month or two was there. I looked at it every day as I passed by. Now it just goes by me, and I go, there he is. Um, <laughs> A man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? Robert Browning. He's raised nine figures, nine figures at that university. It's not just about being an athletic coach. He's created a brand. Who'd ever heard of Pennsylvania State University until he got there? I was doing a banquet, and uh, he was standing on the side, and, you know, he always made me nervous. He, he's going, come on, come on, come on, come on, just spit it out, spit it out. And I said, uh, uh, Joey, you know I love you. And everybody went, oh, call Joe, Joe Pa, Joey. Steve is being escorted to the front by his parents, Matt and Sue Delich. Dad little education that his mom complained about being wasted as a football coach was put to good use. He's had a lot of influence over a wide variety of people, and uh, he drives you nuts, and he drove me up a freaking wall, and I drove him crazy. But there are some people that they talk about, and they say, there's no way you're that good. And then every now and then, one comes along, and then you go, you know what? He is that good. And Joe's one of them. You know, the world is so screwed up. You know, we got Protestants shooting Catholics and Catholics shooting Protestants in Ireland. You got Muslims want to kill Jews and Jews want to do this. And you got whites that, that, that have no respect for blacks and blacks that don't trust whites and the whole bit. But then when you come together, as, as a football team like this comes together and you come here and you get... And, and you realize what love's all about, and how much we can, how much, how all the ills that we can in the world could be settled if you could just get everybody in a locker room. <laughs> Words can't express how proud I am of you. You've had all kinds of problems. People have berated you. They've acted like we didn't have any guts. You've overcome everything with poise and determination, and you're stuck together. If I live to be a thousand, I'll never forget any of you. I'm going to miss you. These four things I know are true. From WNEP-TV, 
the news station. This is News Watch 16 at 11. Well, the worst of the Arctic blast may be over, but really, camping out tonight? See why and see how many of us are trying to cut back on skyrocketing heating bills. It's our top story on Newswatch 16 at 11. Good evening, everyone. I'm Marisa Burke. And I'm Mike Lewis. Thank you for joining us on this Friday night. Well, in just a minute, Chief Meteorologist Tom Clark will let us know about the warm-up finally headed our way this weekend. But tonight, it's still bitter cold out there with wind chills well below zero. How about this? We found folks camping out in Wyoming County tonight. Chizik family from Scranton kept warm by toasting some marshmallows around a campfire. They head to the Highland Campground near Lake Winona almost every weekend, no matter what. There you go. Time to get out even, uh, even the owners think we're crazy. But we're down here, and we're the only ones. As you can see, though, we have, a, we have another couple that does come up on Saturdays. The one next to us, they come up. And the family from Scranton says they've been camping all their lives, and even bitter cold like this just doesn't bother them. All right, let's get a first look at that forecast tonight. <laughs> Chief Meteorologist Tom Clark in the backyard, Tom. Well, Marisa, Mike, it is not as brutal tonight as last night. 15 out back. The wind chill tonight about one below zero. Uh, still a very cold night. Take a look at some of these temperatures now across uh, the viewing area. It is 11. Mount Pocono, 16 at Williamsport. I think temps tonight will stay above zero. And we do have uh, just some flurries showing up on Doppler 2 radar from Tawanda on up towards Susquehanna County. Nothing uh, to accumulate, just a dusting in those spots overnight tonight. So it will be just partly cloudy to clear overnight tonight. Temperatures about 8 above in Honesdale, 14 in Broadheadsville, 11 above zero tonight in Kingston, and about 9 in Jersey Shore. Indeed, the worst is over, and the warm-up is underway. We All survived. Right. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we made it. we'll get back to you. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Well, you've noticed, no doubt, that winter weather like this is sending our heating bills through the roof. But tonight, Newswatch 16's Jody Reynosa shows us how some people managed to lower those bills without lowering the thermostat. This winter season, the Purdy family is making sure to stay toasty warm. They've added this cold burning stove to go along with the furnace at their house in Hughestown. They tell us watching Newswatch 16 in their family room is much more enjoyable now with the added heat. It's doing a great job. I didn't, wasn't sure if it would work as well as it is, but uh, yeah, it's doing fine for me. Rick Purdy says the maintenance is pretty easy too. You know, dump a bucket of coal on it and empty the ashes every other day or so. That's about it. Then they dump the ashes here, outside on their driveway. It helps out all the way around. <laughs> there you go. Saves us money on rock salt, saves us money on oil. That's, that's good. And more than just the Purdy's are taking advantage of this hot item. Here at Country Fireplace Showroom in DuPont, Gary Magden says sales are red hot. Last year was a very bad year. It was a slow year for everything. You know, coal, gas, wood. Uh, this year is complete opposite. We're really going crazy this year with the business. Magnin says during the winter months, October through May, if you have a coal burning stove like this one to heat your home, about $550. If you solely rely on gas and oil, that price will be about two to $300 a month. Besides the savings, Magnin tells us having a second source of heat is always helpful, just in case your furnace freezes. Jody Reynosa, Newswatch 16, DuPont. We have some other news to tell you about tonight. A wreck in Luzerne County left one person dead, another badly hurt. These pictures just back from the scene. Police tell us that around 9 o'clock tonight, a car lost control on Route 29 near Lake Silkworth. The driver was dead at the scene. A helicopter flew a passenger to the hospital after the crash in Luzerne County. A soldier saga continues tonight. Three former soldiers based in our area demand an investigation of the Army. Lisa Gurman of Hazleton, Timothy Kanjar of Moscow, and Scott McKenzie of Western PA want to Capitol Hill to investigate because they insist they did nothing wrong while overseeing Iraqi prisoners. The three reservists based in Luzerne County were discharged from the Army last month for punching and kicking Iraqi prisoners of war. Now they want Congress to investigate their case. The truth is there were no broken bones. There were no broken noses, no broken ribs. The truth is that night was not a night of chaos. 
Late today, the general in charge of U.S. forces in Iraq announced the Army will start a criminal investigation into reports that Iraqi prisoners have been abused by American soldiers. Michael Jackson threw a huge party tonight at his Neverland Ranch. His guests were fans, including children, who earlier today showed up to see Jackson plead not guilty to child molestation charges. ABC's Carla Wall is showing us how this five-minute arraignment today turned into a day-long spectacle. This was perhaps the strangest moment in a day full of spectacle, a seemingly spontaneous after-court performance by the King of Pop. From the beginning, Michael Jackson played to the several hundred fans who had come to support him, some from very far away. It's like a stop on our vacation, you know? I drove three hours to get here, and it was worth it. By the time Jackson made it through the metal detector and into court, he was 21 minutes late. The judge was not amused, telling him it was an insult to the court. In a low voice, the 45-year-old star pled not guilty to all nine counts against him, including seven of molesting a young boy. Today suggests that we have a long haul. We're not permitted to comment on the substance of anything that happened. The judge imposed a gag order on the attorneys and Jackson, who left speaking only to his fans. I love my fans. I love my fans. ABC News has learned the prosecution plans to call as a witness another boy who accused the star of sexual abuse in 1993, but settled out of court for a reported $20 million. And no confidentiality agreement that he'd signed would no. prohibit him from testifying. Absolutely not. Still, Jackson was in a partying mood, inviting fans to a get-together at his Neverland Ranch, a party the invitation read held in the spirit of love and togetherness. It was surreal. It was just beyond my wildest dreams, as cliche as that sounds. It was wonderful. I felt like a kid. It was great. The spectacle is just beginning. Jackson's team is due back in court February 13th. It's unclear.